Okay. Well, it is 10 o'clock, Rabbi. Where would you All like right. to take us today? You know, did you want to hear from about Chavruta? Do you want yes, to let's talk a little bit about what you did yesterday and what you thought of Psalm 20. So if a few people could just report about your uh, Chavruta yesterday and where you, any responses, questions about Psalm 20, and then we're going to continue with Psalm 20 today. Lisa Brown. So I was with um, <clears throat> Jeffrey and Lori, forgive me, I'm forgetting last names, and Monica. And we had such an amazing journey through this psalm. And I think what we ended up with was that basically it was a relationship defined by faith with an entity that you didn't know. Um, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, Saul Zalkin. So <clears throat> I was with Ruth Plabe and Betsy Imersham. I think that's her name. Um, uh, we talked about how in the Fisher interpretation, he, uh, he, we are stretching our, we are appealing to the great out there and the great out there is reaching towards us. That it's together we do this. Beautiful. That it's not sitting back and waiting you know, for the great out there to solve our problems. I told the story to them about the man and the flood. I'm sure you've all heard about yeah. it. You know, God, God will protect me. And when he dies in the flood, God says, he complains to God and God says, look, I sent you a warning. Yeah. I sent you a boat, or somebody yeah. knocking on your door and I sent you a boat. Yeah. You yeah. ignore me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a great story. There are many versions of it, and it's a really it's, it's it has a lot of depth to it, right? We, we, yep. Sarah Sloan. I was with Alice Sales and Margot Cates, and we had a lot of trouble with the Fisher getting into it until we decided to look at the structure of the psalm itself, the way Fisher wrote it, and then compare it to the um, structure of the Bernstein. And um, we sort of decided we liked the Bernstein more. Tell me why. Give us, give me some, you know, uh, something concrete or what made you like the Bernstein? I, I, I push you to do this only because I want you to do the same for yourselves. You know, no, don't just say I like that or I like, try and understand or, and help me understand what about it you like more. Um, it seemed easier to understand and it seemed more true to the original. Uh-huh. OK, good. Thank you. I, can I add something? <laughs> sure. From, were you, in that, you were in that group, Alice? Yeah. 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 I think that the Fisher sounded more militaristic to us, mm -hmm. like yeah. preparing for battle. And the Bernstein was more, you know, but metal melts and metal twists. And um, others seek salvation. I'm looking at the Bernstein now in, in uh, guns and tanks. Bernstein was more personal about it, I think. Uh-huh. Yeah. And that is definitely her, her general hashkafa, we would say, her general orientation. Mm -hmm. Hashkafa yeah. is a really good Hebrew word. It means outlook or, uh, mm -hmm. and kind of a hashkafa is, you know, what's somebody's general perspective on the world? It's a really good word. And it nice. really, you know, so her hashkafa and her psalms is just yeah. quite personal. She's not trying to yeah. answer the problems of the world larger. That's, and that's, yeah, yeah, so that's her, yeah. Nice, thank you. Thank you, Alice. Mm -hmm. There's, yeah. Someone is not out, oh, Allison? Okay, uh, Sumir's, go ahead. Uh, I was with Donna Gray and Randy Axelrod, and we had a question that we're hoping we could get some clarity on, which was around what Fisher put as Jacob's mystery and the other translations translate as the name of Jacob's God. And we don't know what the reference is. It's a really good question. And I want to talk about that. We're going to look at Fisher together. I think that's a really, that's curious uh, why he says that. And I have some thoughts. So let, let's hold that. We're going to look at Fisher together, but excellent question. I mean, it goes back to the whole question of why is Jacob mentioned? Why is the God of Jacob? Remember that even came up initially. Why not the God of Abraham and Isaac? And it, it, it jumps out at us because it's asking us to ask, what are you talking about? So good. We'll get back to that when we look over Fisher. 
Alicia found. But that's a very excellent, I'm very pleased to hear that question because part of tech study is looking for things that are a little problematic or things that are asking us to say, what are you doing there? You know, that's an excellent text. That's a very classical Jewish text uh, skill to develop. You're looking for things that don't look right or look out of place or unusual or a little problematic. And why is the God of Jacob brought here? And that's why you can see each one of the interpreters try to do something with that because it's asked, it's begging for that. Thank you, Sue. Alicia Fowler. I think related, we were, I was with um, Judy Hollinger and Sherry Gells and we were caught on the power of naming and of knowing the name of something mm -hmm. and how Fisher creates this lovely phrasing of namelessness, your unsayableness, your yes. nameless name. So he, which obviously can be a very clear reference to Adonai and not being able to say the tetragrammaton, but mm -hmm. um, just how he's turned that into this sort of state of mess, those constant nouns. Um, and we were just really caught on that phrase, but the power of knowing the name of something and that's very Jacob demanding yes. who is yes. who is this angel? Who is what's your name? And the ah, person, that's a beautiful connection. The Ish refuses. I think both Judy and Sherry said that. Wow. Um, let's see. Uh, Michael Goldstein. Yes, uh, I was with uh, Stephen Dim and Golda Lee, and uh, Golda Lee, uh, in reaction to uh, uh, the teaching of Psalm 20 from Levy, uh, said that she had internalized it and uh, it had it had addressed an anxiety that she had had, and uh, uh, Stephen and I felt a little more distant towards it, uh -huh. that we were reading it as a literature and we hadn't internalized the psalm in the way that she had or that others had in the psalm class. Uh -huh. and, uh, we did divide it into uh, uh, when times are hard, uh, hear me, and then we split uh, in the fourth verse, I'm looking at the uh, Bernstein, uh, that uh, Others have girded in armor, and we know true power lies in you, uh, the strength of man, so he can stand to live. In other words, uh, we have interpreted the psalm as a uh, uh, an appeal for belief and mm -hmm. and faith that uh, we are doing the right thing and turning to Adonai. Beautiful, Jeremy. I, I was with uh, Darina and, and Sarah's uh, iPad. <laughs> um, the, the, tense of the, the tense of the psalm in all the translations seems to change a lot. It starts out with a request, um, like in, which is pat, present, send us help except to remember our offerings, except in honor our burnt sacrifices. Uh, then in the Fisher, it's clear, I know now that the dedicated ones will feel your saving grace. It's almost as if the petitions have already been answered. Huh? Um, uh, some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we trust your namelessness, they lie. Mm -hmm. prostrate fall and so we're in the yep. so we're in the past and then we seem to return to the present the other thing that that my group talked about was uh nameless names scrawled on our banners that all sides walk into war with feeling that they have god on their side and um inscribe god's name in some way on their banners. Uh, sometimes it's a contest between gods in ancient days. Um, but even today, everybody walks into battle. Those people in the streets, uh, those people attacking the Capitol, um, those people in the streets protesting the police, those people attacking the Capitol feel that they have God on their side and that the wars don't end that in this country we've been at war constantly with one in one war or another since World War II, whether it was the Cold War or Afghanistan 
Um, and uh, so they lie prostrate, fall, and never happens. Interesting, very interesting, Jeremy. Excellent, thank you. Darina had her hand up, but it disappeared. Darina, did you have something you wanted to say? If I was together with Jeremy in the same group, so she said it all. Okay. Excellent, so, thank you. So, so, ever so, oh. so I, I, oh, oh, Michelle Zalkin has Michelle her hand Zalkin. up. Mm -hmm. right, right up. Thank you. Uh, I we I was with Dean Drescher, and we uh, also looked at the Jacobs mystery, and she had a really um, <clears throat> interesting comment that struck me about how Jacob was transformed, and it gave me reasons to think about that word transformation. And then the last word, the last line, now as we call out to your calling, to think about what what is uh your calling so the calling of the nameless one the unsayableness uh -huh. one and the connection between us calling out and the un unsayableness <laughs> one's response so that was among the things we looked at thank you yep and that would require looking up, up the jacob issue i wanted to respond to the issue about the masculine god that bernstein or bernstein uses and uh, i see folks have recommended two other books that i'm not familiar with and i will order and look at them and uh, maybe we'll be able to include some of them most modern orthodox jews will say to you they do not believe that god has gender and when they use he and this is something that they will say because They'll say using he is as random as using any language because God is ineffable. There is no way to talk about God. And so it's a language convention. They do not believe God is male, but they have language is limited by genderedness. And the convention is to refer to God that way. I don't think Bernstein in her mind or in the way she prays thinks of God as a man. I do not. She's a modern Orthodox person. I don't think she even hears it as masculine uh, at this stage in her personal career, you know, kind of life. That's, uh, that's what would be true of most modern Orthodox Jews today. They would not say that they think of God as a man. They reject the idea that God has gender and it's a language convention. We know that that might be limiting for some of us because we, we at CBST, we haven't used masculine English pronouns for God since 1980. So at CBST and many of the worlds we swim in, it's totally jarring. But I can assure, but I just want to say that it's a little complicated for us to read how somebody else is reading it. We can't know what they intend. And in their world, he, they don't even hear the he. Now, in you can go, you can say, okay, but that points to, you know, a uh, sexist view of religion, you know, that making he the norm and she would be other is of course sexist. That's true. I don't disagree with you. I'm a feminist. I don't disagree with you. I just don't see it. I try to get to what Bernstein is going to. And personally, I over, I can uh, overlook the maleness. Yes. And I agree about man and human. I just think for her, that's not the point that, but it doesn't mean it makes it an obstacle for you to read it. For me, it no longer does. I'm so used to reading these things and trying to get to the religious point, but I understand there are things that will be obstacles that'll make it impossible for people to get to. And for her, that's just not a, um, it's just, I, don't, I do not believe that for her, that's where she's thinking. Okay, but it could be an obstacle for you and you could reject everything she does because that obstacle is too big for you to get over and get to the religious truth. It's like what I do when I go to the original Psalms. I don't let the language conventions of 2,500 years ago be obstacles for me to try and get to the deeper spiritual truth. But I understand if this is your first time accessing the Psalms and you haven't spent the kind of time, th those things are obstacles. They're like brick walls. You say, I cannot go there because for me, this is insulting me as a, as a feminist who understands male or female who understands the world to be much more evolved. So I totally understand people experiences as an obstacle, but I, I personally don't, but I get it. 
I get it. And it's a way of like, when I hear them talking, when I read the Psalms talking in language about, for instance, the word melech for king, which is throughout our liturgy. I no longer, after the years and years and years, and I went through different stages of my own personal prayer practice. Could I use the word melech? Could I talk about machut, sovereignty? And I've personally gotten to a stage where the word itself is no longer an obstacle for me. I think about melech in very different ways than king. Um, and I've gone beyond what the literal meaning of the word is for me personally. So when I pray myself personally, when I daven on my own at home or when I lead prayer at CBST, I don't, that is not a brick wall for me. I get that it can be a brick wall for people and at different stages of my life, I was much more focused on those issues and it just happens where I am right now. You know, talk to me in 10 years. I might be at a different stage in life. We're always evolving and changing as human beings. And, but the grappling is wonderful. And responding and figuring it out and rejecting and absorbing, all of that is wonderful. Staying engaged, I think, is the point. And some of engagement means rejecting some things, right? It's a, that's fantastic. So... Um, uh, but I'm happy to look at these books, which I'm not familiar with, and happy to include them in our study as we study Psalms and see what they do with them. So we're all evolving and growing. So thanks for those recommendations, and I'll look at them. And uh, yes. In, in chat, Simon says, Rabbi, what is it that you think of when you see king or liturgy, Malach, Malchut in in worship. So for me, I think about it, and you've probably heard me talk a little, I, I often, not every year, but some years during Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, when this is your Rosh Hashanah in particular, which is an entire holiday that in the liturgy is focused on Malchut, uh, and in the Hebrew, it's super clear. I feel, um, uh, I feel I, for me, it connects to, and you've heard me talk about the different ways of relating to God. There's an imminent God, which is the God, the sense of holiness that's found internally in our human sphere, in nature, in art, in the ways that we function in the beauty of relationships that I would call the imminent God, the God that's very, very, very close and intimate. And that God is very important to me. Then there's the transcendent sense of God, and that's where I see Malchut. There is a power in the universe that's bigger than the human experience, that is, that it has more power than just the ability to create in the human experience. And so I, when I pray, I'm very aware of both of those relationships of God. And for me, Melech, or sovereignty, uh, brings the power of something larger than me to mind. Okay, other let's this is a very this is a very good conversation. So yeah. let's see. Susan Stein, I saw has her hand up and I saw that okay, she yeah, was so this is an important discussion yeah. to have about language, and I'm eager to hear what you think. Does the Shoresh from Malach mean anything? Is literally it means king ah. or, or Mahut is a kingdom or rulership. Thank you. But very literally, but that's why poetry is not about literal meanings and prayer is not about literal. And so I try to go to the deeper truth of what it, what were they trying to go for? When they used in ancient worlds, the concept of king, that was the political system that they experienced. So they were talking about somebody who had power over. Hmm. Uh, that's all the hands. Okay, anything else in the comments, um, Harold, that uh, I can respond to now? Uh, okay, hold on. Um, Keith Brown has her hand up and Lori Spear does now. Okay, Lori Spear then. Um, somebody mentioned the uh, Kohenet, the Hebrew Priestess Institute. Uh -huh. I was at a service and um, their translation of the Parsha was read where everything that was male was translated into female. It was, it was jarring because it was new, but it was also jarring because I would like to move, I personally would be happier with a non-gendered text rather than focusing on maleness or femaleness. E either one makes me uncomfortable because I don't think of God in, as a gendered, I can't even use the word being, but 
presence or yeah, presence. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't think of God as being gendered. Well, this has been, you know, a source since Marcia Falk published her prayer book. There was a feminist, couple of feminist prayer books from the 70s, which completely made everything feminine mm -hmm. or went entirely neutral. So Ruach Elohim became very popular for a while. This Ruach meaning spirit of Elohim of God or Ruach HaOlam, the spirit of the earth. And then the trans world really started pushing back and saying, uh, interestingly, we don't want everything neutral, so to speak, that gender is important to us. And uh, we want there to be the option, so to speak, that gender is important and sometimes gender. So there's been a lot. This is a very, very, very rich debate that's going on right now in the universe. And the 70s, in which the feminism of my world in the 70s, which did try to femin make everything into the feminine, uh, has now been, uh, there's a lot of response of saying, well, feminine isn't the answer either. God isn't necessarily female either. So let's go to neutral. Or, but then there's a response, well, but we want to see ourselves and their gender does exist. So maybe we need, for those who see themselves as gendered, they need themselves reflected as gendered. And for those who they see themselves as non-binary, there needs to be something else altogether. So the, the, this discussion is extremely rich and going in many, many, many different ways. So that's why we try to do a little of everything at CBSD, which might be, um, and because of course, we're talking about something that is ineffable. Ineffable means you cannot talk about it. So we're trying to use human language to discuss something that's impossible to discuss. So every way of doing it will have limitations. I'm looking at the uh, Reconstructionist uh, Sidor on page 152 in Berhot HaShachar, where the word Adonai is translated 14, uh, uh, over a dozen different ways, depending on the prayer, awakener, provident, fashion. And that's based on a Sephardic tradition. The Reconstructionist didn't come up with that. Okay. In many Sephardic uh, prayer books, the, because there are many, 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 many different names for God in Hebrew. And what they, so what the Reconstructionists did is to use all the different names of God that are legitimately in Jewish tradition that are describing attributes. So very famously, my, this debate, by the way, is not new, although the focus on gender might be new. Maimonides wrote very famously about this question of how do we know God? How can we talk about God it's, if God is ineffable? So Maimonides famously said, what we have to do is talk about characteristics because we can't have a name, but we could talk about characteristics. So what the Reconstructionists did in their Sidur, which I don't think they explain well enough, but it's a wonderful, it was a very creative concept, is they took this Ramban or Maimonidean concept, which is used in some Sephardic traditions. And instead of you just using the name of God, they use a characteristic, source of life, source of healing, compassionate one. And so you'll notice they're all characteristics because Maimonides argued we can't know, we don't know the name of whatever this power is, but we can identify what are the characteristics through which we experience holiness or the Holy One in the universe. So that's another direction. And that's this debate and this discussion of what word works to talk about God and one word, what words are alienating is very deep in Jewish tradition, very deep. The gender question, that's a little newer, but the, uh, but the larger discussion of this word doesn't work, well, try this word, this doesn't work, is because nothing ultimately is enough. Well, Cantor Nimi? Yeah, just, um, excuse me for not being able to come on video, but um, I, I remember having a great conversation with, I think, Dr. Rachel Adler, who's a professor at the LA HUC campus about this exact idea that because, because of that ineffability, that means that every metaphor, every description of God is inherently metaphor because we can't actually get to that true essence and that no metaphor is perfect. And so the only solution is to try to use as many different kinds of metaphors as possible that work for us in the various moments when they work and to discard them when they don't work and to just try to have a fluid way of being able to describe the divine in a way that works for us in that, in that moment. And I think those of us who are of the age that I think many of us in this class are, 
uh, have to remember that we are shaped by the 60s and 70s in a way that young people today are not and their response to language and the questions about language are quite different. And um, the explorations of language that go way deep, that don't reject gender, but wanna go way beyond is something that for those of us who are 60s and 70s created uh, is really foreign. And that's why we've brought uh, Zevi in a lot this year and we're, we'll continue to do so because in the young trans and non-binary world, Language has a whole different uh, has a whole different very profound meaning, and uh, I think that's there's a huge gap that exists uh, among the different generational hashkafot <laughs> outlooks that influence even the way we think about God, which is actually obvious. But when you're inside whatever water you live in, you think that water is the truth, and uh, it's hard to kind of that's the way it is, right? Oh, we have a look. A lot of hands now. Judy Hollander. Thank you, Cantor Nimi, for that. Yes, Rachel Adler was is a great thinker on all of these issues. Um, I wanted to say something that may get missed. I was at Cohenet when it started, and so that was 2005 or six. And the anger and hostility of a lot of people towards traditional religion was alien to me. And I also agreed with, I think, somebody Greenstein who said even the female saying Shahina instead of I don't know, I may, it's too narrow. But I think that um, we have to never forget how women were treated. So it's not just how God's name is. It's how women are treated in the congregation with the old rabbis who could get the aliyah, who could um, even get their hands raised and get be called on, that it's not just the name of God, but it's, it's how we are as people and that's one of the issues that transcends what we call God. It's how the congregations treated women, how women were treated within the context of the religion that has caused so much alienation. Absolutely, correct. Thank you, Judy. And we're thrilled that you're a Kohenet and you bring that to CBSD. <laughs> yeah. Shep Wannan. And your hair is looking great, Judy. Uh, thank you, it's, it's growing. It's a, I'm a left brained Kohenet, which seems like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. so, um, yeah. So am I on? Yes, yeah. Hi. Yeah. So, okay. So I, I was just, I, I know we have to use king in, in Hebrew and sometimes in English as a, just a default thing uh, to describe God, but I never thought of God as having a gender because that would mean God has genitals. And what's he going to do with it? There's nobody to be with. <laughs> He doesn't reproduce. I mean, God doesn't reproduce. To me, my, one of the Maimonides uh, things about uh, God was that he's incorporeal. So if God is incorporeal, he has, God, he again, that God has no body. So there's, there's nothing male about God. I, but then as you were speaking, I think we should think of God as non-binary. I think that's the solution. Isn't that a good idea? I mean, that's a great idea, I think. Sure, um, I mean, that's absolutely possible, right? It's I and, like that idea. I think anything that shatters, yeah, and I think it's really good to shatter whatever conventions you have. That's even why I don't like the word God, right? Because there's too much attached to it. It's just how do you, I, it's yeah, yeah. to let go of it. But anything that shatters, some, you know, some convention is good because whatever we're talking about is way beyond any individual convention. So it's really important to shatter. I, I, and what Judy says is absolutely right. Women have been very badly treated by most religious traditions. And since we're talking about Judaism, certainly by Judaism. So it's, you know, it's a reflection of that, that God has given the, you know, the good, the, the powerful part of the human experience, the he part reflects that. So, yeah. I just think I, I use the word he or whatever, but I, I I don't think of God as male. That's just a word, but I I don't see God as male. It's not possible. You know, at CBST, we when the ritual committee still existed, we had we had a rule that nobody could use the word he, the pronoun he, or the word Lord to refer to God from the bima. So even if you were giving a try right. and that was your custom, you could not do it. That was that predated me. Linda Solomon. Yes, hi. Um, Rabbi, something you said <clears throat> made me question, I questioned, um, did you, 
go away. <laughs> um, my phone is ringing. Um, uh, I am sorry. Push on. You said that you um, believe that the question of gender for God is rather new. Questioning the gender of God is rather a new topic. I'm not well, so sure I agree since that. The, since the 70s. Yeah, but I don't think I agree with that. I think that this might have been a question for women as far back as forever. And uh, it just wasn't discussed among men and women together. I think that yeah. these questions were que women's questions from before ever forever that might be true i just haven't seen any evidence of yeah it. i know i realize that oh. and the the other i just one one more thing i wanted to say i always used he in my discussion of god because i never found that the word itself bothered me so um you know i've used it and then i've questioned myself sometimes when i have used it and caught myself but um it, it's not something that bothers me particularly because it's what i grew up with i guess so all right we're going to take the there are four more comments and then we're going to stop today's discussion which is really rich and we'll bring more of these topics in if this is what's of interest and if anybody hasn't read the classic book which really is seen as uh, beginning the conversation on a scholar level, it's Judith Plaskow's book, Standing Again at Sinai. And that's, uh, if you haven't read it, it's really, really worth reading. Judith Plaskow, Standing Again at Sinai. Much is written about this in all different, in all different traditions. And uh, we're, this, this, this discussion is just beginning to touch the tip of the iceberg, but uh, right. uh, maybe we should do a class on this next year. Dean. Yeah, I wanted to support that, Rabbi. Um, Bernadette Bruton, Dr. Bernadette yes. Bruton, who is a scholar, an ancient uh, ancient world scholar and has written a lot. She wrote a wonderful book on the first and second century women rabbis. Yeah. Um, but beyond that, um, what she talked about is that we it was not the contemporary age that the understanding in the ancient world was about power relationships so that there was an aggressor and a receptive. So that a child and a woman had a male child and a woman had the same kind of level so that if you were the aggressor and may, you know, had sexual intimate relationships with either, it was fine, but that they didn't distinguish along gender. It was, I mean, they did, but it was more uh, nuanced in terms of power. I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. Good, thank you. Uh, Lisa Brown. I totally agree that this is a power issue. I'm just kind of talking about how we're taught. You know what I'm doing with the poetry of the Psalms and making them meaningful for us today, but the larger issues, I could talk about that for a long time. I could teach a lot about, yes, Bernadette Bruton, by the way, is a good friend of mine, and I have been very influenced by her work, and uh, she's really brilliant, really, really, really brilliant. Different, uh, kind of a different, yep, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Was Lisa, Lisa Brown was next. So I, I think there, there actually is an essential error, I, I mean, going on what Dean has said, um, I think there's a, a mistake in always tying the universal energy forces of masculine and feminine to human gender, and then to, and then to putting hierarchy and judgments in there. Because I personally think that there is such a thing as masculine and feminine, but it doesn't necessarily live in men and women. You know, all of us have all of these components. Um, it's that women generally have more feminine nature, not always, but generally. Um, and then there's judgment, then there is sort of human hierarchy um, put on top of that. So, I mean, in a way, the argument is sort of an apples and oranges one. You know, we, we argue against the way that we've used these terms, but they exist, I think. Uh-huh. Well, that's, that's part of the big discussion. How do, what do they mean in the world? And as everybody says, Everything has a political meaning. Everything has a theological meaning. And there is an intersection of those things. And who gets to write the books, of course, influence how we look at things. And by and large, through Jewish history, men have written the books. 
So all of that is true. What I'm trying to get at with the Psalms is how do we, whoever we are as human beings, have a personal relationship with these texts? Okay. Alice, well, sales. Of... Alice sales, and then Sherry, and then we'll move on to something else. Yeah, I, I guess uh, people have written in the chat about what Judy wrote in the chat about um, man is made in God's image. And that line bothers me so much. Be why? <laughs> Um, because I just feel like whatever, or my feeling about God is not that that man was made in his image, it's that all life is created mm -hmm. by whatever force that is, whatever unknown that is. So the whole discussion of gender, I think, comes from that belief that humans are somehow specially made by God in his image and nothing else is. I don't, I don't know what to do with that. Well, just to tell you, first of all, the language, this would be great to study. I actually taught a course on this once many years ago, but it's et adam b'tzalmo. Adam, we think is, means primal humanity is created. B'tzalem Elohim bara oto, God created all of them. Zachar unakeva, male and female. Mm -hmm. So both are in that verse. Right, but it's humans. It's humans creating, created in His image, rather than what about the trees, the birds? Okay, so that's a different animals. issue. Of but yeah. in terms of uh, female, is in that sentence. It's not just right, man. right. It's but it, to me, it's just the human human beings. Okay, so that's a different issue. Different in terms than of the gender other, issue, just in yeah. terms of that gender issue. Okay, yes. good. It's different. That's principle. a whole other question about the relationship okay. with the non-human world. Yeah. yeah thank yep. you. And Sherry. <clears throat> Excuse me. I just want to talk from someone who has listened to people. <clears throat> Excuse me, for many years, and and uh, particularly some people I knew who said God is male because it's written down that God is male, you know, and he. But I kept saying to them, not even knowing Hebrew or anything, you know, he is kind of like a fallback in in languages that don't have a neuter. You know what I mean? I'm not saying that this isn't a masculine sort of thing that was written, but I, as I said, I could accept it as saying, well, there wasn't another word. There wasn't another pronoun that that didn't have gender in it, yep. you know? And so the fallback is always sort of masculine there. Right, and that's the big question. Why is that the norm? And female is not the norm, it's the other. But those are longer and much bigger conversations so um, we are gonna pause this conversation and I love that you're bringing all these things up and we'll continue doing it as we study the Psalms. Um, Harold and Annika and I wanna pause class now to have a conversation about the future and uh, proposed some transformations of the class. Tomorrow we will continue with Psalm 20 and then we will do some offerings that will be due five o'clock on Sunday on Psalm 20. But we wanna make some